Hey, this is Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, host of the Armed Lutheran Radio Podcast, reminding you that the podcast you're listening to is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out all the great content at selfdefenseradio.net. Treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Never point a firearm at anything you're not willing to kill or destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you are on target and ready to fire. Always be sure of your target and what lies beyond it. Hi, and welcome to the Polite Society Podcast, powered by the Firearms Policy Coalition. We're recording this one on Monday, May the 18th, 2020. I've got the right year, and I'm Paul Lathrop. I'm Rob Morris, and on tonight's show, we talk with Cody Wisniewski about the Second Amendment cases waiting in the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm John Richardson, and we'll talk about some good gun laws coming out of Louisiana. I'm Dana Lufer. And in one of our DGUs, an armed intruder, met a family guarded by an armed defender. So climb aboard, strap in, and hang on. Episode 543 of the Polite Society Podcast starts right now. Well, if it's Monday, this must be Polite Society Podcast. We're just a little bit past 6 in the evening as we record this live on Facebook. like to remind everybody watching on Facebook, you can comment on our live video. And when the comment comes in, I'll pop it up and uh, we'll discuss it on the air. Rob, as our usual new uh, personal news segment starts, what have you been up to since the last time we've been on the air, man? I've gained some weight because Louisiana is finally open again. And we're trying to support all the restaurants. Um, so I've been taking my wife out, visiting friends as best we can. Um, oh, Second Amendment stuff. Glad you asked. Bill Frady and I uh, got together on his lock and load radio program. That's now at 3 p.m. Central. Carried every day. Did some dry practice. Recorded another episode of Self-Defense Gun Stories. The world keeps going around. John? Is it boring for you, too? It's boring. For me, it's another boring week here in the mountains of North Carolina. No travel, no working in the woods, no shooting other than dry fire practice. Uh, North Carolina is still pretty much closed, thanks to our Democrat governor, though he just lost a federal court battle on closing churches, and he is not going to appeal. Though he's still mealy mouth saying, well, I hope... You know, people will be, you know, smart about it, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. And I, also, yeah. And I also found that our, out this week that our Secretary of Health and Human Services, who I refer to as Little Dr. Mandy, used to be Obama's number two in charge of Medicare. I'm like, that explains a lot. Yeah. You're going off on a little bit of a tangent here because I think we're going to have time in this opening segment. Did you all see on Facebook the picture? I think this lady's from California. I swear to God, if she's not a zombie, she's a half step away from the lady that's in charge yeah. of California's health care system. Oh, dear it, God. It, it looks like an anorexic albino. It's, yes. She's just scary. The Walking Dead is a reality show. You combine that with the lady in in uh, pennsylvania that that looks i swear to god she needs a shave and i'm not saying well, right she used to be mm. richard levine yeah literally so yeah there's some high quality people in some of these states uh yeah i i don't i i, I speaking from their pictures yeah it, it, it they they you can never char you can never I don't look like a mental giant myself. But and I wouldn't presume to uh assign their intellect to their visual what they look like, but the oh boy, there's some tough looking people. I <laughs> just So Gary, what's up with you, man? Well, speaking of rough states, uh, things are uh, locked down until no one ever dies again in Illinois. <laughs> uh, um, of course, my, my office is in Dallas, uh, outside of Dallas. So 
they actually have the ability to open this week. Um, the boss has decided to give that a break and take it week by week. Uh, everybody's still working and productive, so uh, not an issue. Uh, and again, I, I don't. I work from home, so everything's kind of same same for me. I mean, uh, I, I, I was talking to some people, and I said, you know, this is this is why we fight. It's not necessarily because it affects us, because it affects me very little. I've always gotten groceries delivered. For 20 plus years, I've gotten groceries delivered. So it, very little affects me like the 1,000% uh, increase in FOID cards, things like that. But, but I got to fight for those that it matters to. And that's what I do. Keep fighting. Dana. Well, it's another wonderful week here in the protest capital of the U.S. Uh, Thursdays have been freedom, two A days. Uh, but before Thursday, uh, Wednesday, you have we've got the barbers and hairstylists that are protesting. Uh, Shelley Luther, the salon, salon owner from Dallas, is up here to lend her support. Uh, and Thursday, we have the Blacks and Latinos Against Racial Empowerment with uh, Rick Ector, Maj Ture, Marcus Weldon, uh, some of the speakers. So it's uh, what what day it is depends on who's protesting at the Capitol <laughs> this, anymore. And uh, I have just been uh, pants on gun on every every day here at the house and the fence is starting to go up. So, oh, and I uh, got registered last week for uh, GRPC. So, good man. Same here. Paul, how about you? Well, I made a uh, I made a fast run out and back. Um, only went to Salt Lake, uh, Denver, and back home this week. It's I, I tell you, this whole thing is a real challenge. It's you would think that you know being somebody who hauls essential freight that uh that trucks you know the truck drivers are going to remain busy well kind of sort of uh when freight when half of the economy shuts down half our freight goes away uh i've been normally i'm out for six days home for 34 hours in which i do the show when I'm home for 34 hours, and then I go back out again. So, you know, five and a half, six days on the road, and then one day at home when I do the show and go out. Well, since this whole, you know, economy shutdown has happened, I've been out three days, maybe four. My income is, is just junk. Uh, bills kind of are getting paid, kind of. Um, it's, it's just... That that's the major thing for me right now is, I I'm having problems getting rolling. Uh, I got home Saturday morning. I delivered yesterday. I leave Wednesday. Now thank goodness it looks like Wednesday. I, I leave Wednesday. Deliver Thursday about seven hundred miles away. Back. Friday, leave Saturday again for a run down to Georgia. So things may be getting back on track for me. Um, as far as doing other things, Amcon is hustling right along. We are planning for that. Is 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 hitting high gear. Things exciting. Things are going to be happening with that. And the charity ride that I'm going to be doing for the SAF uh, leading up to Amcon and GRPC. That website should be live. I'm hoping by Friday. I actually went out and hired a real, honest to goodness, no kidding web developer that knows what the heck she's doing, and uh, and uh, she's going to help me get that site up and running. So those that have been asking about it uh, and how they can contribute, that should be all up and running in the next week, and you should be hearing from me in a lot of places because I'm going to go all over the place promoting it about it in the next two to three weeks. So uh, training we've got 
I think I'd have to check a calendar. This is either the last time or the next to the last time I can tell you about this. We have coming up the end of this month on the uh, on the 30th and 31st. We've got active self-protection coming up to South Dakota. The class is officially on. We're past the break-even point, and uh, it's going to happen. The Cover Your Asp Tour is coming to Sioux Falls. If you are at all interested in getting some training in and uh, meeting up with some great people, having a lot of fun, go to ActiveSelfProtection.com, hit the training tab, get signed up. These classes are really reasonably priced, and uh, we'd love to see you up here in the Sioux Falls area this coming uh, in about two weeks from now. So uh, let's see here. What else? Uh, well, let's talk about the Self-Defense Radio Network. Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, you can see right now on your screen, our website has got 12 right now, soon to be more. Great shows you can listen to right off the website. Shows like Armed Lutheran Radio, Survival and Basic Badassery, Mind for Survival, uh, Unload and Show Clear. A lot of great shows on the network. You can listen and you can subscribe right from the website. That's at sdrn.com. U.S. We're going to go ahead and step aside to break. When we come back, we've got Cody Wisniewski, and we're going to be talking to him about uh, legal challenges possibly going up in front of the Supreme Court that support our Second Amendment. We'll be back with that right after this. This portion of the Polite Society podcast is brought to you by the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. If you carry a defensive handgun, you need protection from the aftermath of prosecution. Even if you do everything right, you can be the victim of an overzealous prosecutor or even be falsely accused. That is where the ACLDN comes in. They provide immediate assistance when you need it most. If you find yourself under arrest, they immediately pay bail money and the retainer for your attorney. Additional funds are available for trial and civil proceedings. Beyond the money, they have far and away the best team in the industry, providing you invaluable information and training DVDs that are included with your membership and who stand ready to work with your lawyer on your defense. People like Masad Ayub, John Farnham, James Fleming, Tom Gibbons, Emmanuel Kappelson, Dennis Tuller, and led by network president Marty Hayes. Initial membership is only $135 for your first year, and you get eight incredible training DVDs and other educational material when you join. If you don't have tens of thousands of dollars to defend yourself at your disposal right now, you need to be a member of the ACLDN. Go to armedcitizensnetwork.org and become a member today. And please mention that you heard about them on the Polite Society Podcast. Hey, and welcome back to the interview segment of the Polite Society Podcast, powered by the Firearms Policy Coalition. Normally you hear me introduce our guests, but uh, John set this one up, and so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to John. All righty. Well, we have with us tonight Cody Wisniewski, who's a staff attorney with the Mountain States Legal Foundation. He's a native Californian, born and raised in San Diego, but spent a number of years in Ontario. Has his undergraduate degree from the University of Iowa, pardon me, University of Ottawa, and then returned home to San Diego to attend the University of San Diego School of Law. He headed their Federalist Society while in law school, and then in 2017, he joined Mountain States Legal Foundation as a staff attorney and is admitted to practice law in the state of Colorado. Currently, he is co-counsel on the lawsuit against the governor of New Mexico and her deeming gun stores and ranges as non-essential and had in ordering them closed. Cody is also a columnist for the Legal Insurrectionist blog. So welcome, Cody. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, one of the main reasons we asked you to be on the podcast was your article in Legal Insurrection on the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case and how you thought it was actually a win for the Second Amendment. Could you expand on that a little bit for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I took a little bit of a different takeaway from that than most people did. So, um, you know, first and foremost, the, the key there is everybody was arguing over mootness and this question of New York City changed its regulation after uh, certiorari was granted, after the Supreme Court agreed to review the merits of the case. And then, of, of course, New York City sw swoops in and amends its regulation and magically 
you know, they give all the relief that the plaintiffs were seeking in that case. But the key takeaway there is that New York City amended its regulation. It, it changed it so that people who have premises licenses can now transport their firearms outside of city limits. And they couldn't do that previously. So one of the big takeaways for me is, is there's now less gun control in New York City. Now, obviously, it's not perfect. It's not you know, a, a complete and unfettered right. Um, there's still restrictions on it. New York is still one of the most restrictive places. But there is less gun control in New York City, and that's a good thing. The other side of it is that part of the reason the court ruled the way it did was because New York State also passed a law that made it impossible or allegedly impossible for New York City to return to its old strategy, its old uh, premises license requirements. And so then not only is there less gun control, but now at least there are more hurdles for them to go back to the old way or them to enact more gun control in that uh, scenario. So I think that that's a big win that a lot of people aren't talking about. There are currently a 10 cases before the Supreme Court waiting to be, they've been distributed for conference. Half of them deal with carry, some deal with interstate sales. Which of these cases on appeal do you think will be granted cert and why? I think the carry cases have a really good shot. It's, I think the Supreme Court is wary of weighing too far into a pure Second Amendment case just because of the optics of it. Of course, you know, the, the court is always concerned with not changing law or setting precedent just to do it. They want to be able to resolve cases and controversies that are important, but they also aren't in the game. They're not meant to just shake the foundation sort of thing. Um, I, I think that's why New York State Rifle and Pistol Association was granted in the first place. It's dealing with transportation of firearms outside the home. So it deals with this idea of the right extending outside the home, which the court acknowledged but didn't weigh in on in Heller. But it's also somewhat clean. There's not a lot of other issues that were infecting that case. So I think the carry cases are pretty likely as, as one of the suspects. And there's a few different carry cases up there. So they could take their pick of the best fact pattern that they want to be able to review or anything like that. The other case that I think stands a pretty good shot would be the California handgun roster case. Um, obviously, California deems all handguns unsafe until they review them, and then they determine that the handgun is not unsafe, uh, which is a little bit of California gymnastics for you there. But that case involves this idea of requiring safety features that aren't in existence, no manufacturer intends to put into existence, and are not possible to accomplish. So this deals a lot with the Caetano scenario, which was the question of whether a stun gun was protected under the Second Amendment. And uh, most of you, if you follow the court, will remember that that case was a per curiam, very short opinion, where the court just dealt with the issue and moved on quite quickly, saying the court obviously, the, the Massachusetts court obviously didn't follow Heller it didn't follow its reasoning. So I think that Pena, which is the California handgun roster case, is also another uh, likely grant in, out of the bunch. Looking at the carry cases, do you think they will pick one and hold the rest in kind of like abeyance and then say, our decision here and remand the rest after they've decided it? Yeah, I think that's pretty likely if they grant one of the carry cases that they would hold the others and then, um, you know, pending resolution, they could grant the GVR, grant, vacate and, and remand. Um, and what that would allow is then all of those cases would go back to the lower courts for decision in light of whatever case they did grant cert in. Um, they could also hold the other Second Amendment cases over. I mean, there's nothing that prohibits them from doing so. They could hold all of them over as they proceed through and um you know depending on how they rule and depending on how they come out uh, the the leading theory right is that the the court or at least those four justices that have expressed a deep concern for the lower court second amendment jurisprudence 
are, are looking for the opportunity to clarify the appropriate test when evaluating Second Amendment challenges. And if the court is going to weigh in on the appropriate test, which Alito kind of did in his dissent in that New York rifle case, then it would make sense for them to hold over some other cases just to ensure that the appropriate uh, standard of review and the appropriate test for evaluating that case is then imported to the other cases that are pending before it. I mean, I'm looking at the- Cody, attorney. can I, oh, can I ask a question, ahead, John? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Cody, I've noticed a pattern recently um, New York changed its laws only after the case was accepted in the U.S. Supreme Court. And by muting it, that means uh, the two federal courts that upheld New York's laws, those cases actually stand uncorrected. No new guidance was given to those courts. We see a very similar pattern in a number of states. Oh, we're going to appeal this closing of gun stores in our state. It comes before a judge. The judge says he'll hear it. It's scheduled. Then the then the um, state says, oh, well, okay, you can, we'll open gun stores under these conditions, start your appeal all over again. I would think that uh, states could perpetually frustrate the taking of a case by the second uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court by just repeating that pattern. Am I wrong? Uh, not exactly. And I'll, I'll kind of touch on each of those briefly. So the New York case, you're, you're correct. I mean, the lower court and the circuit court both issued a decision on the merits. Um, but this, those decisions don't stand. The, the Supreme Court was concerned with mootness and remanded the case for further consideration in light of the new regulation which means that it's not that those opinions stand as authoritative anymore, but rather they kind of have to start, not all over, but they have to start the inquiry again with a question of the effect of the new regulation. The petitioners in New York Rifle maintained that even though they that New York City allowed for transportation, they weren't clear in their new um, ordinance, which stop, could potentially stop people from making stops along the way. So those, right. those opinions um, persu or aren't uh, binding authority anymore because the case is still ongoing and the court has said that the lower court needs to, the Supreme Court has said the lower court needs to review it. Um, in the, the gun store cases, it's a little bit different because a lot of times what's happening is as the situation is evolving, and, and this is exactly what we had in our New Mexico litigation um, that we're currently going through is, you know, we filed the lawsuit, we filed for an injunction to stop the state from um, enforcing its its law closing gun stores and right. then the governor reopened gun stores now those cases um, can certainly still proceed on the merits because the question there and what you're hitting on is this idea of capable of repetition and the question is is the injury and is the violation alleged is it capable of repetition by the acting party against the same petitioner or the same plaintiff so in the gun store closure case, you have something where, you know, if, if this happens again, if we get another spike in the fall and if places start closing down again, then, it, you know, under the current regime, then a lot of governors believe that they still would have the authority to close those gun stores down. And we obviously disagree with that. So there is this idea of capable of repetition, and that's what they fought over a lot in um, New York Rifle. And this idea that New York was a bad actor and I don't think that is going to forget that. Even the more progressive leading ones are obviously going to see what New York did. And I would be shocked if it didn't leave a bad taste in most of the justices' mouths. Not enough for them to take the case. For example, during this uh, COVID lockdown, we had the mayor of New Orleans essentially issue similar regulations that said you cannot carry nor uh, transport your firearms. Sounds like the New York case again. And since no guidance was issued, okay, start at the bottom, work your way up. Yeah, and it's certainly a problem. The one other thing that I, I highlight um, when I was talking about New York Rifle is 
I can uncertainly, I mean, as somebody who does this litigation and, and files amicus briefs and, and works in this world, I definitely understand everybody's frustration. Having a, an authoritative Supreme Court opinion that set forth the standard of review would make my life significantly easier <laughs> as I bring cases to the courts. But I think the big takeaway is obviously the court is really concerned um, with legitimacy right now. There's a lot of those open questions, right, rightfully or wrongfully. I mean, there's a lot of attacks on the legitimacy of the court and some of the legitimacy, le legitimacy of its decisions. Um, and, and that's a problem right now. And we already have problems relying on Heller and McDonald in courts and district courts and circuit courts don't really like to follow them. They skirt around them. They apply means and scrutiny, even though the Supreme Court said you don't do that. You know, they apply weakened forms of intermediate scrutiny, even though that's not appropriate. But right. they're already trying to skirt around Heller and McDonald. And I can only imagine what it would have been like if our third, three of three, uh, authoritative Supreme Court decision was New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. Every time one of us tried decided in court, there would always be the immediate argument where, oh, well, that case was actually moot, and it's not really that authoritative because that discussion wasn't relevant to the final decision. So you can only imagine what it would be like to, you know, have to hang your hat on that case for the next 10 years. I mean, it's been 10 years since McDonald was decided. Obviously, Caetano was in between, but that i think that's a big factor that um you know we're forgetting is it would be really tough we sh we would rightfully have been able to rely on that case if five justices said that it wasn't moot and issued an authoritative ruling but you know that every time we cited it it would be a, a battle just to deal with that underlying mootness question so i can certainly understand the frustration but i think that's a big consideration that we should all think of when, as we go forward Yeah, that that was actually something I had not thought about, to be honest. And you know, when I'm looking at the cases that are before the court, I mean, Carrie is there. Uh, you have some heavyweight appellate lawyers, Alan Gur, Gura, Paul Clement, among others. Um, so, going to New Mexico. So your lawsuit against. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is still going on and still, did I understand correctly that she has allowed some gun stores, but not all gun stores to open up? If I could, real quick, uh, folks, we are right up on the end of the break. Cody, I'm going to have you hang on, and we're going to get to that question right after the break, if that's all right. Sounds good. All right. Folks, do hang on. We'll be back with the answer to that question and more with Cody right after this. This portion of the Polite Society podcast is brought to you by The Complete Combatant. The Complete Combatant is designed for a broad base of citizens that range from students that don't own a gun on up to advanced students that train often. The Complete Combatant offers several different courses that build upon each other from avoidance, using verbal commands, and preparing for contact, lethal versus non-lethal decisions, your 911 call, interacting with the police, to even dealing with the legal system in the aftermath. The Complete Combatant courses are a layered approach for all levels of experience that will walk you through all the many stages of decisions while developing a game plan tailored to your skills and your everyday carry. Please visit www.thecompletecombatant.com and make sure you mention this ad to receive 15% off. Again, that's www.thecompletecombatant.com and mention the ad for 15% off. We are back. This is the second interview segment with Cody Wisniewski. Cody, I'm sorry for interrupting you like that, but... Uh, what about John's question? Uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and go from here. Yeah, the question was that, uh, as I understand it, that some gun stores in some ranges have been allowed to open, but there are some others, larger ones especially, have not been able to open, reopen. Is that correct? Oh, I hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got his, i got to do this. Now it should work. I'm sorry, Matt. 
I'm sorry, John. Wow. Bad night for me. Cody, my question was that, as I understand it, the governor of New Mexico has allowed some gun stores to reopen, but not others. Is that correct? That was correct for a portion. So on April 30th um, was when the governor announced that she was going to be um, allowing gun stores to reopen as of May 1st. But that was on an appointment system only. So you had to purchase the gun and then you could make an appointment and then go in and do the in-person transfer. Um, however, when she made that decision and, and that new order, there were three counties in New Mexico that remained closed. And those were identified as some of the highest risk counties, uh, according to the governor and according to the, the public health. So those counties remained closed. However, um, there was another new order that was just issued at the end of last week that updated again. And now the gun stores that were on the appointment based system are now open to 25% of their retail capacity. So um, they're open to foot traffic, people coming in, but they're limited to 25% of their fire code order um, or their fire code allotment, the fire marshal capacity. That's the, <laughs> but those three counties that were closed previously still are now open on the appointment based system. So uh, as of right now, all firearm retailers and ranges in the state of New Mexico are able to open and operate at some capacity. The counties that were closed, were they larger counties, small counties? Um, they are, were not like the Albuquerque counties. It wasn't the, the county around Albuquerque. It was in the, I believe it was the northwest of the state that was predominantly what was closed. Okay. Changing the subject somewhat, you lived in Canada for a number of years. Do you have an opinion about Trudeau's ban on semi-automatic rifles? You know, I, I think it shows us the importance of the system that we have um, in America. I'm, I'm a dual citizen. I'm half Canadian, half American. Um, I've obviously uh, chosen where I prefer to reside and, and which system I prefer at this point. I love Canada. But I think it shows the importance of the system we have. The idea that the prime minister could come out and, based on one event and very little, little evidence and actual data, just wholesale ban a entire category of arms that people overwhelmingly use for self-defense. They were already highly restricted in Canada and very difficult to obtain. The idea that the prime minister could just come out and do that is a terrifying thought and something that I'm glad that we don't have here. Um, although obviously we've seen more and more restrictions coming from state level as well as executive orders changing interpretations of um, ATF definitions and whatnot and statutory definitions. So, you know, it's we're, we're trending in the wrong direction in a lot of contexts. We're trending in the right direction in some. But I think that's my biggest takeaway from Canada is just the, the sheer authority or power that the prime minister had just to be able to kind of make a decision for all of the residents of that country that they weren't able to own a certain type of firearm because it was deemed to be worse than others. You know, I know Canada doesn't have the second amendment and my knowledge of Ca Canadian history and jurisprudence is pretty slim. <laughs> don't necessarily have a constitution or do they? Canada has a constitution. It's, it's a different system than ours. Basically ours is designed as, or it's supposed to be designed as a very small, um, you know, unitary federal government and then very powerful state governments. That was our, our founders and framers thought that, you know, the, the powers and, and rules of the federal system should be small and few and that the power of the state should be many and infinite, essentially, um, that the state would be the most important actor in your life. Now, that's not exactly the system that we have today, but that's certainly what they had in mind. Um, Canada is almost the opposite. Canada has a, a very strong um, federal government, much more modeled after the English parliamentary system and has weaker provincial governments. Now, they do have 
uh, some adoptions from, from U.S. structure and style, but for the most part, it's kind of a strong central authority and weaker provincial governments. If at the next election, the conservatives take over or some other non-liberal party, could they overturn Trudeau's order in council and say that the ban was null and void? You know, I haven't looked directly at the, I haven't read the full language of Trudeau's order. Um, my understanding of it would be if it was, it'd be similar to our executive orders and that, um, you know, another president can overrule a previous president's executive order. It's the office, not the person kind of thing. Um, but I'm not exactly sure how that is or, or has proceeded through uh, the Canadian parliamentary system for its final approval. Okay. Well, going back to the Mountain States Legal Foundation, you guys have a history of taking and working on Second Amendment cases. You had the par post office parking lot case in Colorado. You had a challenge to the FOID card or not allowing non-residents to apply for a FOID card in Illinois, among others. What's uh, Mountain States working on now in the Second Amendment realm? Absolutely. And, and we're really focusing now and refocusing our efforts to try and have a concerted approach to Second Amendment cases. So one of the things that we're doing and that we're looking to do is actually found a, um, a new center within Mountain States Legal Foundation called the Center to Keep and Bear Arms. And the goal of that center will be to have a clear, concerted um, focus on litigation only. So we don't do any sort of lobbying. We don't do policy work. We just litigate. And we you know, file cases. We do media um, just to support our litigation. So the center is going to focus on that. And the goal will be in those areas of you know, keeping, bearing, and arms to be focusing on establishing good precedent in those areas, to be able to use that to reform this area of law and to bring us back much more closely aligned with what the founders and framers believed that we should have as a system. And, you know, the, the small federal government, the very few limited restrictions, if any, on, you know, the right to keep and bear arms and related to that foundational principle of self-defense from both man and tyranny and focusing on that. So our goal is, is really to have a concerted push in the courts to help have that conversation with judges, but also to backstop other organizations' efforts that they're having um, and making those discuss having those discussions in legislatures across the country, including in Washington, D.C. So it's going to be a litigation effort. It's going to be focused, and it's going to be advancing in those specific areas. Well, I mean, you just have to look at your New Mexico case to see you guys working with others, you had the NRA, you had Second Amendment Foundation, you had the Firearms Policy Coalition, you had the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association. I hope I have that one, last one right. But you had a lot of different uh, organizations. And I think that's probably what we're going to have to see happen among all the different 2 a organizations is to work together. And, you know, we're seeing that a lot more and in a lot of these contexts now, we've, we are all fighting the same fight. We're doing it. We might be doing it in different venues. We might be, you know, representing different clients, but at the end of the day, we're all pushing for the same thing. I mean, we're trying to ensure that Americans natural right to self-defense, your right to keep and bear arms is protected no matter where you live in this country. I mean, that's a foundational principle for us. So. We're, we are really excited to be able to, to team up with all of those organizations. You know, I've got um, friends and colleagues and all of them who are doing great work. So there's, there's so much work and there are so many issues out there that there's more than enough to, to keep us all busy. So, you know, when we have the opportunity like New Mexico to team up with everybody and bring the case on behalf of all of us, that's a great opportunity for us. You know, in other contexts, um, you know, we currently have litigation against the city of Boulder for their... Uh, ban against modern sporting rifles and uh, standard capacity magazines. Uh, you know, that one we brought on our, on our own and, and we're more than happy to do those and we're able to do those cases as well. So it's kind of this 
it's a, a, a joint approach and everybody's working really well together to try and advance the cause and advance the mission. In general, though, do you tend to try to take cases up and down the Rockies? Yeah, so we focus on kind of the mountain states region, um, you know, focusing on the western side of the country. And, and part of it, it's, it's twofold. One, obviously, we can have a, a better impact if we're more focused on a lot of those cases. The other side is, right, the West has this very specific kind of uh, that frontier spirit it's really founded on, uh, again, those foundational principles from, you know, the, the late 1700s. And those were brought up again as the West was being founded in the, the 1800s and on. And this idea that you could walk out and found a life just because of the sweat on your, you know, your, your sweat and your effort. And a lot of that was also predicated on your ability to defend yourself and defend your property and, and defend your family. So, you know, there's a particular view of that right uh, in the West that is just a little bit different based on kind of the Western history. So we like looking at that a lot and being able to you know, remind the courts how we got here and, and why these Western states are the way they are and why there are so many rural communities in the West where it doesn't matter what you think politically in many contexts, the, you know, where you land on the issues, uh, overwhelmingly those people support the second amendment and the ability to, to keep and bear arms because they have to for their way of life. And we really try and focus on that Western way of life in a lot of our cases. But that being said, um, you know, we do have cases across the nation and, we regularly file amicus briefs with uh, circuit courts around the nation as well to our colleagues and our, our the other litigators that are dealing with the same things that we are. Well, unless anybody else has questions, tell, Cody, tell us where we can find out more about Mountain States Legal Foundation and your work. Absolutely. So, you can visit us at mslegal.org. Um, there you'll see all the cases that we have. We also post most of our filings about our cases. You can sign up for our newsletter on there so that you can get updates um, as we go through and we litigate. We don't just do Second Amendment work. We also do natural resources work, um, grazing, oil issues, as well as some just general foundational uh, issues. So you can find uh, a lot about us there. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter if you want, at the Wizard of Laws with a Z. Um, I generally am yelling about gun laws till the, the wee hours in the morning as I'm working on cases. So uh, you can find out more about us at, at both of those locations. Awesome. Well, Cody, thank you again for joining us tonight. It's it's been it's been interesting to say the least. Uh, you have an open invitation, man. Whenever anything comes up that you want a little bit of publicity for, reach out. We'll get you back on the air, man. So, folks, Absolutely. we are going to thank you so much, and, and thanks, guys, for having. Me. You bet. We are going to step aside to break, folks. We've got our news segment come up, coming up, including some good news out of Louisiana. We'll get to that right after this from Concealment Solutions. This portion of the Polite Society podcast is brought to you by Concealment Solutions. Jason Christensen makes the most comfortable inside the waistband holster on the market bar none, the Black Mamba. Some of the other products offered are the Sidewinder outside the waistband holster and Python gun belts. Every product that Concealment Solutions makes has unsurpassed craftsmanship that shows in the fit and finish of the product. Visit ConcealmentSolutions.com to view all of the products available and you can get 10% off your order when you enter the promo code POLITICS in the promo code box at checkout. That's ConcealmentSolutions.com. And welcome back to the Polite Society Podcast, powered by the Firearms Policy Coalition. This is our news segment, and I do want to re remind everybody, as Charlie just did on Facebook, throw your comments in on uh, the Facebook Live video, and we will get them up on the air and uh, discuss them. Charlie just said, uh, great interview. I agree. Cody, uh, that's, I believe, the first time we had Cody on the air. And uh, very intelligent, very articulate, and uh, great information from him. So, uh, news, guys. I kind of teased going into the news segment that uh, we had some good news in Louisiana, some pro-gun bills 
are up before the legislature. Rob, that's your adopted neck of the woods now. Uh, what do you know about uh, where those where those bills stand? Well, they've uh, been passed, I believe, was it out of the House? No, it went to the Senate. Uh, the NRA said they put out a call. I went to the NRA ILA site, didn't see anything listed for Louisiana. GOA put out a call. I forwarded their request for support to my uh, local friends, the gun organizations I knew in Louisiana. Thank you, GOA. What the bills do is remove the restrictions for carrying a firearm in church. Also, they re uh, restrict local government's ability to regulate firearms at playgrounds, public buildings, and commercial establishments, basically preemption. Um, the law says, oh, you can't uh, preempt this, that, and the other thing, and local governments then find wording around the law. This is a way to close some of those loopholes that gov local governments are using. It also removes the ability of the governor to declare um, restrictions on firearms during an emergency. I think that is aimed in part at a Democrat governor we have now, and at the mayor of New Orleans, who said, oh, I understand that, you know, I can't do it during a hurricane. This isn't a hurricane. This is a health emergency. Therefore, you can't buy, sell, or transport. Mm, the legislature said no. Yeah, that's good. I mean, we, we in North Carolina had to go to federal court. Actually, we were the first case after the McDonald decision in Bateman, and that was exactly the did a snowstorm down in the Piedmont cause the rest of people in North in the mountains or the people on the coast not to be able to carry outside right. their homes, etc. Shall we go on to New Jersey? Do we sure. have to go to New Jersey? Yeah, you can go to New Jersey if you like. <laughs> we can we can talk about it from a distance. That's even better. <laughs> yes, there you go. Grant's not here, so. Well, the news I said that was that Northam said that was it outdoor gun ranges could open. And now, uh, Dana, your headline says he reneged on that. Do you know what's well, going on? He had said last week that indoor ranges could open as well. Ah, and the law and he, then he put then forward. He yep, went big back switch. On it. That's so. Uh, and then I think he was saying that in certain northern Virginia counties, they could keep them closed. Um, let's see. Ghost guns. I didn't see the 60-minute piece on it, but I'm sure it's the same. It, I didn't see it either, but it was Can, just like, I can't do it. One of the things I... Wow. The citizens are smart. They've seen their rights brutally abused. They've seen various government agencies say, you can't get a gun. And they said, okay, when I can, I will. Which meant that this April was another record month for sales. Not as much as March. There's the summer dip between the hunting season. So you have the COVID panic overlaid on the normal seasonal variations still a record april mm -hmm. and then you look at the claim that the government will protect you except we find out that the saudi terrorist had been an al-qaeda operative for years okay the fbi is not going to protect me um we find out that states are essentially abusing the NICS system the federal government the FBI in particular saying, hey, we need more manpower because of all these uh, background check demands. And then we have states that run their concealed carry list every night. Mm -hmm. You, because of the way the statistics play out, licensed concealed carry holders are the safest demographic we can find on the planet. So you couldn't, if you randomly chose anybody else, 
you'd be more likely to find criminals than if you looked for at concealed carry holders. Which various states, thank you, Illinois comes to mind, does every night. And then the next system is saying, gosh, we're overloaded. And we're caught in a bind. If we say, oh, we should charge the states that abuse the system that way, then, they'll, then those states will in turn and say, I'm sorry, we can't process your application to own a firearm because we've gobbled up all the money by running useless background checks. Well, and what they would honestly do, I, in my opinion, is they would pass that straight along to the people who are going, uh, King, may I please? Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the cost of the already astronomic cost of a firearms carry permit. Uh, in in Illinois, would go up by you know ten dollars right. a day, so they can still do their background. Still checks. do it, yeah. Still do the background check. What? And the background checks in Illinois are not just on the carry permits, as I understand it. Oh, all the FOID the cards. FOID cards every yeah. day, right? Three, um, million, three million FOID cards and three hundred fifty thousand carry permits every day run. And so I'm run twice because I have both. Have both. Well, and all carry permit holders have both, I would think. Of course, um, yeah. And on top of that, then we see judges who say, oh, you're a convicted felon. You've been brought in with a firearm. It looks like you were, by the other things you were carrying in your car, it looks like you were about to commit a violent crime. Oh, but due to COVID, we'll release you. So the notion that the government will protect us in any dimension is called into question. I think our fellow citizens were wise to go buy a gun. You know, Michael Bain Austin says, you are, you on, are your on your own, own and you are. Well, and, and I want to go, I want to touch, I'm going to skip around a little bit in the news here. I want to touch on Rob's comment about abuse of power and and expand on that a bit and this also not only are you on your own the government may be actively fighting you i want to talk about this is not directly gun related but governor kate brown in oregon mm -hmm. when uh, a a salon owner said look i've got to feed my kids we're going to do everything the cdc says we're going to follow all the recommendations but I've got to reopen or my business tanks, my employees are done. Uh, I'm going to have to fire everybody. i got to do something. I've got to open. Kate Brown not only uh, revokes her license, she sends the Department of Welfare to this lady's house. Child Protective Services. Yeah, to check on her kids. I mean, the, and OSHA to her business. Yes. Yeah, and... and she, let me bring up one point. She's a salon owner, but the people who work in her salon are not her employees. They rent chairs like most, which happens in almost every beauty salon I've right. ever been in. But their OSHA have said, oh, wait a minute, you, they're your employees, so therefore we're going to charge you $14,000 fine, even though it doesn't really apply to you. Now, the good news is, a judge saw this crazy stuff and said, oh, Governor Brown, no, it's been more than 28 days. You have no authority to issue. I, you can't close churches, nor can you close businesses. Next case. Yeah. So that may mute the, the fines. I don't know. Well, uh, but that is a county judge, and, she, uh, and Governor Brown immediately said, well, I'm going to go to the state Supreme Court. And, and fine, but... Now she's got to ask for an injunction to hold his ruling in abeyance. Right, right. So uh, my understanding is, at least temporarily, that uh, this business owner will be allowed to operate and mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. won't have to pay a fourteen thousand dollars. I mean, talk about uh, this is this is using a sledgehammer to swat a mosquito. Is what the governor did. This is well, the just same, like in Dallas. This is the same socialism yes. we saw in Chicago and what we saw in Dallas. Yeah, Dallas, well, yeah, you know, Paul, it's not Michigan. the four, yeah, in Michigan, but Michigan. it's not the fourteen thousand dollar fine, Paul. It's the thousands and thousands of dollars it costs for a lawyer. Oh yeah, 
to get to the fine. Right. You, you know, I mean, that, that's the thing. And, and that's, you know, that's why they sue all these gun companies, because then they have to go to court and and fight and fight and fight because it costs money for lawyers. So it's not the fourteen thousand dollar fine. It's the money you had to pay to just keep it, just keep it from becoming in, uh, extreme. I would venture a guess that just in lawyers fees for something like that, you're looking at fourteen thousand yeah. to get it going. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Gary. Okay. There were are we just talking to a narrow segment of the population or do you think other people are listening? I would draw your attention that there were two elections last week. Mm -hmm. They're for uh special elections for congressional seats. One uh was held by a Democrat. That was the gal who was having affairs with all over the place, staff members outside her marriage. She was in a throuple. She, she was in a mess. And one was, uh, so that was the Democrat in California who held the seat. The other one was a Republican in Wisconsin. His wife is having a baby. It looks like the baby's health uh, is in, in jeopardy. And he said, I'm not going to be here to vote. I'm taking care of my family. So in both cases, though, Republicans won those seats. I think the people in the middle are are saying our government is abusive. I mean, on our local news tonight, we just saw it. Some it was called the Rise and Shine Cafe in North Asheville, and it was just interesting that the reporter just happened to be there at the, exactly the same time as some police officer went in and served them with a citation for being open and having as being open for more than just takeout. You can't tell me that the media wasn't, you know, heads up, go be here at this certain time, and you'll see us, you know, swat down this miscreant who dared to open against the governor's order. Mm -hmm. Nobody on this show is trying to tell you that, John. Well, I know that. <laughs> Yeah, the, it's uh, you, what's it? What's it like to be a pro dictator shill? Good God! Yeah, I understand they have to report, but yeah, you, you got actually, actually, no, they don't. And how they report? Hi, here's a here's a cop way abusing government authority. Show me the victim. And I mean, if they did that twice, they'd stop calling. Well, exactly, and they did interview somebody. Oh, I came over here and I had a good breakfast, and I'm glad she was open and everything was, you know, distanced properly. I felt safe. I can't see why they're giving her trouble. There you go. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say I've been uh, since our restrictions were lifted on restaurants. Uh, I want to say there's been three times I've been out <laughs> and, and, and went into a restaurant and ate, including there's a there's a brand new restaurant. I'm going to get a little bit of a free plug here. The uh, the Alliance here in Sioux Falls. It's a uh, the VFW and the uh, the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars bought a huge building and consolidated their operations into one building, including opening a restaurant. And Susan's a veteran. And uh, so we went in, uh, was, yes, yesterday, we went in and had lunch with a friend. Uh, excellent lunch. And, uh, but the, the way it was run and the way every restaurant I've been to since this thing is as, as uh, the, since the restrictions have started being lifted, the only person that got anywhere close to us at all was the waitress. And the waitress uh, at this particular restaurant we went to the other day, it was uh, when she approached us, uh, she kept her distance. There was a mask, and, and when she brought the food out, there was gloves, and it was, it was all very, very sanitary. And I just I, I felt absolutely safe being in there and, uh, and patronizing their business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I know 
Paul's worried about time. Should we go on to DGUs? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? Because we are coming up about 20 seconds on the end of the segment. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead. and We're going to step aside. We're going to do DGUs when we come back, and then we'll close the show up after that. So hang on, everybody. We'll be right back right after this. Firearm Safety Institute is one of Northwest Illinois' premier firearm training companies. They provide superior firearm training to all levels of shooters. Gary Doherty has been a trainer and concealed weapons permit holder for many years. While living in Nevada, he carried legally and has the experience to train you to do the same. Firearms Safety Institute offers a wide range of courses designed to meet the personal needs of both seasoned shooters and those that are new to the world of firearms. If you are looking to apply for the Illinois Concealed Carry License, Firearm Safety Institute can provide you with the professional training that meets the state's requirements. Gary accommodates classes of all sizes and can provide individualized instruction if that is your personal preference. He's happy to work with you and your friends to arrange private classes and will come to your location and work around your schedule. If you would like to get your Illinois CCW or increase your firearm knowledge or skills, go to FirearmSafetyInstitute.com to start the conversation. Mention the Polite Society podcast and receive a 10% discount on your training. Remember, that's FirearmSafetyInstitute.com. Get your Illinois CCW today. Hey, and welcome back to the Defensive Gun Use segment of the Polite Society podcast powered by the Firearms Policy Coalition. Now, to start off with, these discussions are not legal advice. Some of us are trainers, but this is not formal training, and you need formal training. The defensive gun use segment is intended as information, not as training. As always, the opinions of the hosts are only their own opinions and not those of any sponsors or other affiliations. I'm going to go ahead and take our first story, and this one comes out to us out of Scottsdale, Arizona. At 10.53 p.m., Scottsdale police received a call that an intruder had been shot. Officers who responded to the call found a man dead who matched the description from an earlier break-in. The homeowner was working on his property when when he was alerted by the family dog to something wrong in the house. Armed with a shotgun, the homeowner went to his child's room and was confronted by a naked suspect who was carrying a large piece of wood. The bare suspect charged at the homeowner, and the homeowner shot him twice. In an interview with Fox 10 Phoenix, for, and quoting here, for Aaron Latowski, his sole responsibility is protecting his wife, three kids, their nanny, as well as the family dog, Sadie. Latowski says Sadie alerted him to the break-in. Quote, so I came inside and I saw one of our side doors was open and she was barking down the hall towards my kids' bedrooms, said Aaron. The rest of the family was asleep at the time. Right away, Latowski says he grabbed his shotgun. Quote, we never would have known, said Aaron's wife, Brenda. We would have continued to sleep through it. I'm just so thankful. Latowski went into his daughter's room where he said the suspect came out with a large piece of wood, his face masked, and his body naked. He was basically lunging at me, so it was very quick, said Aaron. He had his hands in the air. I could see something dark or black coming at me. Again, it was very, very close, so I fired almost immediately. Toxicology reports, Rob, have not been released as of this time. All right, uh, who's up uh, first in show notes? Rob. Uh, Me do. There you go. What's up, man? Great job. Now, let's. is there anything we might want to do better? I'm glad he had a gun in his home. Close your doors. Because you want him to make noise. If, if I mean, kicking down the door and the noise it makes is a poor man's alarm. Bring a flashlight. What if this is your, you know, drunk brother who's made an unexpected visit? A drunk neighbor. And the third one is, oh, I've got a long gun in a hall closet. You have to look at geometry. What if you have to fight past an intruder to get to your gun. I understand a shotgun is a very effective weapon, but it trips me when I dance, so I don't carry it all the time. Whereas my sidearm is a little more flexible. John, do you see anything else? Well, uh, I've read about the story elsewhere, and I love what Mr. 
Latovsky said about it. He said, God bless America and the Second Amendment. Glad I was able to protect my family. God bless the police for coming so quick to take care of us. And he's right. The one thing, what's the old saying from uh, Thunder Ranch? You carry a pistol so you can get fight your way to your long gun that you should have been carrying to begin with. Um, Something. and I've always had trouble with that because by the time you get to your long gun, most fights are way, way over. Yeah. Which like, means we should be able to have short barreled firearms. There you go. Without a $200 <laughs> tax. Yes. Well, it's like what, uh, John Korea says about, uh, doing a reload. Yeah. Doesn't happen. It, it, it doesn't happen. So. Um, I want to mention on this one, dogs are an awesome, awesome security system. They are a living, breathing uh, alert to there's something wrong going on here. Uh, I, I absolutely treasure our two dogs, and they, they know their job. They know it very well. I do want to mention as a colliery to that, that they are not, they are a security system. They are not a defensive system. Right. Once the dogs let you know something is going on, their job is done. It's your job to deal with the intruder or whatever is going on. It is not the dog's job. So, Paul, the issue I have is every squirrel, every kid riding a bike, every gust of wind outside and the dog barks and after a while instead of going to look it's shut up you know so yeah hard to tell and you know what though with our dogs i mean there there's the there's the squirrel bark there's the rabbit bark you know <laughs> and then there's the there's somebody on the porch that shouldn't be there bark okay yeah you learn you learn the dog's barks uh, they become different depending on what's going on. John, you've got a great comment that you've written up in show notes. Yeah, I saw pictures of Sadie. Beautiful dog. And, but having seen pictures of Sadie, I would have been really hesitant to enter the house if I were a criminal. Sadie's a Doberman. And evidently, Sadie's not enough of a muscle dog to put a bite on somebody who doesn't belong. Or maybe, well, it could be that she's not an aggressive Doberman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and the other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, on this one. I, we're we're eating the, our our time with this one, but we we've been really on 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 time the rest of the show. We can go a little long if we have to. But uh, the guy's naked. Uh, he's he he's got a face mask on, but that's it. So apparently he wants to attack him, but doesn't want to give him coronavirus or whatever. I'm going to say if there's a naked person in your house and they're holding anything in their hands whatsoever, I'm thinking that could probably pretty easily be described as a lethal threat. Uh, because obviously, and obviously, there are mental issues going on and the person has a problem with control. A naked person in my daughter's bedroom is... Yeah, key no. thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Dana, you're up in show notes for this one. At midnight, a 27-year-old kicked in the front door of a home. He had a weapon in his hands. Inside the home were a man, a woman, and two children at the time. The woman ran toward the bedroom as the intruder opened fire. He was bent in the hallway by Antoine Booker, who returned fire. The intruder was struck by Booker's shots and ran from the home. He fell in the front yard where he breathed his last breath. Following the shooting, the woman and children fled across the street to safety and called 911. Booker remained in the home until he determined that the attacker had acted alone and then left. Union County Sheriff David Taylor received a call from an attorney who said he was with Booker, who was involved in the shooting. The, inter the attorney and Booker went to the sheriff's office to give statements. 
Investigators determined the shooting stemmed from a domestic violence call on the previous Sunday. The de deceased intruder had outstanding warrants for domestic violence, third degree, and two counts of assault and battery, third degree. Deputies had not been able to locate him, and the woman had changed locks because she feared for her and her children's safety. It was determined Booker had been invited to the house, had a right to be in the home, and the shooting was in self-defense. Um, okay, so she changed the locks. That means everybody in the house got the heads-up call that Karash, oh, that's an intruder alert. It would be even better if there was maybe a motion sensor light on the front porch that buys you another couple seconds. It doesn't say how the intruder was shot. Because if you only have a few seconds warning, hi, I'm going to run to one part of the house and get my shotgun and rack it and get it out of the, you know, secure storage. I'm hoping he was carrying on his body. Anybody else see something? Well, I think uh, from the way it read, it, it, it sounded as though Booker, uh, who's the invited guest of the uh, the woman, uh, was down the hall in the in a uh, bedroom, and so he came towards the intruder, armed, as the woman went past him, running into the field of fire to escape. Or past him R again away if, from the fire. Well, okay, that that's not how I read it. But yeah. anyway, any more on this one? I want to go back to the last one because I I had a lot going on here and I wasn't able to check social media, as, Facebook, as oh, okay. we were as we were discussing that. But we've got some good comments on the last one that I want to. Uh, that I want to bring up. Uh, Dave says slug, double O, a double O buckshot or birdshot. Uh, Dana, on that la first story, do you know what the round was? Did it, it was it anywhere in the news that the uh, what was used? No, it wasn't. Uh, wasn't in the uh, the story. Yeah, yeah. I and I'm I I'm not certain myself i but uh, inside the range of a house i i'm a big one on don't use buckshot or don't use birdshot for a defensive yes. round it's 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 not effective yep. but if you're if you're within touching distance i don't care what it is if it's coming out the end of a 12 gauge it's effective it's when you get past touching distance mm -hmm. that uh that you have issues. And then um, Matt sent two uh, comments that were really good. Little dogs can sometimes be annoying, but they know how to alert mom or dad that it was someone is coming too close to the house slash door. And then uh, after that, he said, little dogs will go up to the door and bark at it versus making little barks or growls at a squirrel in the yard and the dogs perch on the back of the couch. And, and, and Matt that's not just little dogs. Our, we have a uh, a uh, one hundred. Our 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 main uh, dog that alerts us is a one hundred twenty five pound pit bull mix, and he we we bought a couch a year and a half ago. It's still here because I'm not buying another one. Because I'm not getting rid of the dog. He's a part of the family. But he will perch on the back of the couch and has pretty much destroyed it. But uh, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, I think that's a dog thing, not necessarily just a, uh, just a little dog thing. But, yeah, and, and, and going back to there's once you get to know your dog, there's the, there's the bird, squirrel, rabbit bark and then there's the you better get away from my house bark so all right i want to mention before we go that we do post each of our news and dgu articles up at polite society podcast.com or we will in a few weeks when the website's back up 
please take a moment to share them with a friend. We do have issues with the website and with hosting with a person I was previously uh, hosting the podcast website on that is getting corrected, but uh, the website for the fundraising charity has to come first. So it'll be a few weeks for the uh, Polite Society podcast site to be up. All right, we are going to step aside to break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about blog posts, and we'll shut the show down. We'll be back right after this. In 1928, Germany required its citizens to register their firearms, making possible Hitler's 1938 Nazi Weapons Act, disarming all Jews. Now ask yourself, what is the real consequence of registration? All in favor of gun control, raise your right hand. Brought to you by Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, America's aggressive civil rights organization, jpfo.org. Hey, and welcome back to the listener feedback and blog section of the Polite Society podcast, powered by the Firearms Policy Coalition. And as viewers can see, but my staff can't, we do have one more comment that came on uh, social media. Uh, Charlie says, buckshot when you want to stop slugs when you want to dismantle so i've also heard that number four is pretty good indoors so mm -hmm. okay yeah. i haven't haven't done the test myself I, and i i for one i don't care how good my hearing protection is i'm not touching off uh <laughs> inside a building i'm not touching off a 12 gauge uh, with with a real charge behind it, not and no, not gonna. I I could have foamies and my electronic muffs over the top, and I I still don't think I want to do that. So all right, uh, as as normal, and 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 thank you for this. We don't, and, and this sounds weird. Thank you for not sending email. Come join us as we record live. It is much better for us to get these. It feels more immediate when people are able to comment on the live video and we get those comments in as the show is going on. It makes me feel like you are more a part of the show. If you want to email, certainly do that. It's on air at politicsandguns.com. Feel free to email us. When I get them, I will read them on the air. But... Uh, I just I much prefer you for us to come see us at 6 p.m. Central Time on Monday night, and uh, and come share with us, come comment, and we'll we'll talk about your comments on the air. Rob, what's been going on over at Slow Facts, man? COVID nineteen might kill a hundred thousand of us in the U.S., but maybe not. We know that putting two hundred million people under a relaxed house arrest will also cost lives and now we have to weigh both factors and ask will shelter in place and social isolation cost more lives than it saves let me remind you that mental health patients drug addicts and alcoholics are at risk from isolation we have to weigh both sides how many alcoholics addicts and mental health patients do we have and when we add it up, we find out that more people are at risk from social isolation than are at risk from COVID. We also know that for each increase of a percent in unemployment, a lot of opium addicts will kill themselves. 3% more per each increase in 1% unemployment. Unemployment has gone up 8%. The official rate has 15 million of us unemployed. The unofficial rate is far higher. Does that mean that uh, house arrest failed to keep us safe? What it means is that house arrest has to be very effective because we know it will cost tens of thousands of lives from those who are effectively in mental health crisis and forced into isolation until we see that house arrest is effective then shelter in place orders are dangerous political theater that articles called did shelter in place save lives or cost them those articles are up at clash daily at ammo land and at my blog slowfacts.wordpress.com john 
Talk to us about No Lawyers, Only Guns and Money. First, I want to say thank you for doing what you've been doing on COVID-19. I have this great fear that there's going to come a time if you have a small business owner, the government shuts him down, he loses his family, he gets to the point where he thinks he has nothing left to lose, and he goes starts hunting politicians and bureaucrats. I hope we never see it, but I wouldn't be surprised. Now, as so far as my blog goes, it was kind of a slower week for blogging as the spirit just didn't move me on some days. That's a bit of a joke considering I went to a Quaker college and Quaker meetings, people are moved by the spirit to speak. Normally, they sit there like bumps on a log. I did want to point out that gun sales as evidenced by the NSSF's adjusted NICS checks are still booming. It was the highest month for an April on in the last 21 years. Checks were up almost 70% compared to April 2019. One thing this does tell me is that there's still a lot of new gun owners and the work that Paul, Rob, and Amanda have done putting together Guns 101 is a really great service and one that is needed. That and more is at onlygunsofmoney.com. <laughs> Paul, we could raise a few bucks if we had a uh polite society podcast branded 1911 made by glock <laughs> <laughs> you know anybody that could come up with a 1911 made by glock would uh would make a little bit of money but you know i, I don't think glock handles 105 year old designs 109 year old designs no they can't handle it at all all right. Uh, before we take off, I do want to mention our listeners group. Uh, go ahead and go to Facebook and search for Polite Society Podcast. Listeners, we're getting new members all the time. We've got great discussions going on there. Give it a give it a look. That does wrap up another episode of the Polite Society Podcast. I'd like to thank Cody Wisniewski for joining us today. So for Amy, Tracy, Bell, Kat, Dana, Gary, John, Rachel, Susan, Amanda, and Rob. Until next time. Stay safe. Be aware. And we'll see you down the road. Views and opinions on the show you just heard are those of the host and the guest and are not necessarily the views of any sponsors or other affiliations. But hey, not everyone is as smart as we are.